Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma, the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Jake Mercier, the chief creative officer of American Moment and part time podcaster, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we, we decided to drag Jake in on the show today and part- insist on drag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he had to be pulled kicking and screaming. Your Twitter is on private. And so most people can't see this. But uh, you tweeted right before we started taping a picture of the table saying, get me out of here or something. I think like it was. That. Why did they make me do this? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, it's funny because Jake is objectively the best looking of all of us by far. And so the fact that he's not doing the show more often is a travesty. But uh, you guys will get the special uh, joy of, of having him on this week uh, where we talk about all things foreign policy, which is definitely uh, Jake's subject area expertise on our team. We had on uh, someone who's a little bit different than many of our guests in terms of his overall political valence, but rock solid on foreign policy. Uh, we had on Dr. William Ruger, who um, uh, I'll get to in a moment as far as his formal bio, but as always, want to encourage you guys to go to AmericanMoment.org where you can find information about the organization, what we're doing. We're uploading pieces to AmCanon about how to think about the world. We have a giant backlog of fantastic podcasts for you to listen to. And we're always throwing up stuff about events we're hosting, programming we're doing, and so on. So be sure to check it out. It's a labor of love that Jake uh, does as our webmaster, along with the 16 other jobs that each of us have to do here at American Moment. So uh, be sure to check it out. We, we did not cheap out on building a cool and easily navigable website. Uh, and it's definitely Jake's brainchild. So if you do have any issues with it, please feel free to send him angry emails. Um, but Without further ado, I uh, want to talk about our guest this week, William Ruger. He serves as the Vice President for Research and Policy at the Charles Koch Institute and Vice President of Foreign Policy at Stand Together. He was previously an Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at Texas State University and an Adjunct Assistant Professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin, my alma mater. Uh, Dr. Ruger is a veteran of the Afghanistan War and an officer in the U.S. Navy, uh, and he is most recently nominated by President Donald Trump as a candidate to serve as U.S. Ambassador Plenipotentiary and Extraordinary uh, to Afghanistan. I love saying the full thing because it just sounds so august, uh, almost like a duke ship. But um, uh, he was never. That's also how I introduce him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. President Plenipotentiary and Extraordinary of American Moment. Uh, that is my full title, uh, accompanied by bugles uh, and everyone bowing. Anyway. Um, Dr. Ruger has been a friend of ours for a few months now. Um, he is, uh, you know, it, there's a classic heresy on the right that, that we have a big issue with here at American Moment, which is that uh, people, especially issue area specificists um, uh, like Dr. Ruger, but, but not him, uh, will say that anything to the left of me is a good faith disagreement and that we must build coalitions and build a big tent and anything to the right of me is literally Hitler. Um, but Dr. Ruger, having a, a, a career of experience working with, in many cases, a, an odd coalition of progressives, centrist leftists, uh, libertarians, and the occasional conservative who's realized what time it is, has had to build together. Uh, broad coalitions on the issue of foreign policy realism and restraint. And we've been pleasantly surprised that he's uh, been fairly generous with his time and uh, uh, in, in engaging with us as well, this more nationalist faction of the right that is equally interested in realism and restraint, albeit for different reasons, uh, as even uh, progressives and libertarians are. And so um, he's, a, he's a generous, a kind, a winsome guy. And so uh, we were really honored to be able to record with him today uh, in another reality where, you know, Donald Trump had won, uh, um, you know, or had officially won the election in 2020, uh, Dr. Ruger may well have presided over an Afghanistan withdrawal, a withdrawal that we wholeheartedly support here at American Moment. And so we navigate the details of, A, why that was the moral thing to do, and then also some of the technical aspects of why it was uh, uh, necessary to do it, and albeit a slightly messy way. And then we, we zoom out and we talk about foreign policy more broadly. I thought it was a, a fantastic episode. Jake, what did you think? I thought it was great. Um, we also touched on China and how to make sure we're not getting into a new Cold War and, and thinking about it realistically. Um, we also talked about the national security state and, uh, you know, being smart about uh, how to deal with basically like, you know, a new war on terror, things like that, and making sure that we're keeping those officials in check and, and yeah, being smart on foreign policy. He was really, really great. And it was really good to have him on and definitely learned a lot, you know, just listening to him talk about it. So, and great. you will too. So listen all the way to the end. And uh, without further ado, we'll go now to Dr. Will Ruger. 
Hi everyone, this is Jake Mercier, Chief Creative Officer of American Moment. Uh, I just wanted to get in here and have a quick disclaimer before the show starts that we did film it on Tuesday, August 24th, a few days before the attack in Kabul. Uh, Dr. Ruger didn't have a chance to comment on the attacks and anything said in this video obviously didn't have that in mind. Um, we want to just say, of course, our hearts go out to those affected and our brave men, servicemen and women uh, who were attacked. And so uh, we really hope you enjoy the episode. Dr. Ruger, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. We always like to start with how people got to the point where they are now. Uh, explain to us how uh, your career got you to the point where you are today, being an expert on the issues you are and, and being influential in the way that you are. Well, uh, when I was an undergrad, I thought that I wanted to be a lawyer and probably thought I was going to get into politics in some way. But I decided I was interested in the study of politics more. So I went to graduate school, became an academic and was in academia for most of my career working on international relations, U.S. foreign policy, counterinsurgency, terrorism, strategic studies, those types of issues, uh, and, um, and really first started to get active in promoting realism and restraint uh, as not merely a, uh, an issue of study, but uh, of something I was advocating in the late 90s, in particular around the war in Kosovo. And then obviously after 9-11, uh, issues around the Iraq War and other issues became so so prominent. But again, I was an I was a scholar. I did scholarly work on a lot of different subjects in international relations, and uh, was a tenured professor eventually. Uh, but I got an opportunity to come to Washington about eight years ago, and I took it, and uh, it's been great since. I mean, I love being a scholar, uh, but it's been great to wake up every morning fighting for the things that you care about, particularly rationalizing our approach to foreign policy away from the, let's face it, failed status quo of primacy that we've been pursuing over the last 20 to 30 years. So getting up every morning and fighting that good fight is uh, is wonderful. Yeah. And so how do you think that your experience you know, in Afghanistan um, as a military officer has kind of informed your thinking on that issue, but also just foreign policy more generally? Yeah, I mean, I was a restrainer uh, before I went to Afghanistan. Uh, I did believe that Afghanistan was a war that, unlike a lot of wars in American history, could be justified on realist grounds, uh, but not the nation building project, not the expanded war aims that we ultimately did see. Uh, and so uh, I think that we did have an important mission there. Uh, and I actually think that we were relatively successful at fighting the war we needed to fight. The problem is, is that we then expanded it and fought a war that was unnecessary and, in fact, counterproductive. So, you know, in terms of the war that we needed to fight, and I think this is one of the reasons why uh, soldiers, you know, sailors, airmen, Marines can take some pride in what we accomplished is that we, we did some things that were important. Because I think restraint, it's very important to, to understand that restraint is not pacifism. It's not naivete about the international system. It's it's not, it doesn't think of the international system as a benign one. It understands that the United States and other countries have interests and they have strategic challenges and threats, and they need a strong national defense to defend against those possibilities of other actors aggressing upon us and our interests. But in Afghanistan, we, we needed to do three things. We needed to punish the Taliban for their state support uh, for al-Qaeda. We needed to decimate a trit al-Qaeda as an effective terrorist organization in that country with the intent and capability to harm the United States. And we needed to kill or capture Osama bin Laden, ideally kill Osama bin Laden, which we achieved. And we achieved all three of those goals, more or less. Uh, and you could say, well, look, the Taliban is coming back into power in Afghanistan. How punished were they? But I think, look, the Taliban suffered greatly from America's invasion uh, and uh, and what we did in terms of deposing them. You know, we targeted their leadership, killed a lot of rank and file. And uh, I think they understand that they were in the wilderness for two decades. Uh, they had been deposed been, and suffered greatly. And I think that they will think twice about doing the kind of state sponsorship uh, of groups that would harm the United States that they had before. Uh, and so I think in that sense, it, it has supported our ability to deter future uh, state support, state sponsorship, at least from the Afghan government. And Al Qaeda doesn't need Afghanistan uh, to try to do what it's trying to do in the international system. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think we could leave, because we don't need a permanent military presence in that country, nor any country, because we need to have the capabilities to target those types of groups wherever they are to defend our interests. So rewinding back to, I guess it would have been the mid to late 2000s, what was the point at which that original mission that you would have supported with those clearly laid out objectives morphed into uh, the expanded mission that liberal internationalists have advocated for over the last 20 years? Or, or, or was it the case that the original mission uh, was achieved much slower because other goals started being mixed in? Just w where did things go wrong? Yeah, I... I it's probably a punt maybe to say all of the above, right? There was a, a kind of uh, mission creep, uh, especially as a lot of different actors which had different interests in the country uh, were part of the coalition. And so there were a lot of different groups that wanted different things out of that conflict. I mean, you know, there were there were international groups and NGOs that that clearly wanted to remake, you know, the middle, you know, the Middle East more generally, but Afghanistan in particular. Uh, there were different countries that had different interests. I mean, this is one of the challenge of coalition warfare, right, is that each country has its own national interests and how they define those things, including the things that are other regarding that they want to do. Uh, and sometimes those can come into collision or different theories about how to do it, uh, you know, how to do counterinsurgency or counterterrorism. And, you know, that happens in any coalition. But I think what happened is that that gradually the United States, A, it was distracted by the war in Iraq, uh, which is probably the biggest debacle in recent foreign policy history. Uh, but that's not why uh, the war in Afghanistan, you know, didn't turn out the way we would have liked. I mean, the fact is, is that it was that we expanded those war aims to something to some things that were simply in, uh, not achievable. And I think this goes to show why conservative principles are valuable, not just domestically, but in the foreign arena as well, because understanding the constraints that any actor has, particularly in trying to re-engineer a society, uh, especially when there's, you know, in a world of, of value pluralism in which people don't necessarily agree with or want or feel their own interests challenged by our values or our ideas, you're going to come across, you know, you're going to face those challenges abroad. Uh, and so when it came to trying to remake the Middle East, right, to, to expand and extend our values or to promote our values, to try to create a central government that could um, gain legitimacy and effectively secure the country and could in many ways uh, shape Afghan society or the societies under in Afghanistan, because it's a very complicated uh, tapestry there. Uh, you know, those things really ran against, I think, what was achievable. And that's why we ultimately, I think, failed. Uh, and, uh, you know, the and, and not to mention the, some of the basic problems of the Afghan government in terms of corruption, in terms of even when we were well intentioned, how international aid money fueled that corruption uh, about some of just the, uh, you know, kind of basic values differences that we had with the Afghan government itself. Um, in terms of some of the actors involved there. Uh, and you could say the quality or lack of quality of some of the leadership. Uh, so I think we ran into so many constraints that failure of the expanded war aims was overdetermined, if you will. At some level, it seems to me that, um, you know, you have to get out at some point. If not, you may be staying there indefinitely trying to fix or change a society into something that it may fundamentally not be able to change into. Um, what do you think about that? And, and why do you think it's taken so long for certain people who seem to have been commentators on this war from the beginning to understand that that is something that's probably not possible? Unfortunately, I think a lot of the people who, who were the architects of this expanded mission still haven't come to grips with that fact, uh, who would still argue that we should be there engaging in this in this, uh, uh, you know, contest, uh, in this conflict. But I, I think I. Uh, a big part of it is, is a, a kind of is a is a bad autopsy of the case, if you will. Um, so, as I would think of it, uh, what we what we what our interests are in Afghanistan would be simply that Afghanistan is not used as a place where terrorist organizations with the intent and capability to harm the United States can utilize. Um, uh, a kind of um, uh, utilize that territory in a in a way where they would, um, you know, be able to engineer or or design. 
these attacks. But to achieve that, it's relatively easy. It's not simple, but relatively easy compared to, say, nation building uh, or even, um, you know, kind of what we did achieve in 2001 in terms of deposing the government. Uh, I think what we need to do is is, is simply uh, maintain proper intelligence capabilities, over the horizon uh, capabilities, uh, and then the ability to use special operations forces or uh, even punitive raids, as Guild Barn Dollar has talked about in his Wall Street Journal piece on this, uh, and and having the will to do that, because part of the problem of 9/11, you know, there were there was a lot of of understanding about the problem of uh, Bin Laden and Al Qaeda, uh, but some part of it was a lack of the hindsight that we have, which was how much of a threat, how much of state resources do we want to utilize, were we willing to pull the trigger to target terrorist organizations, because terrorism before 9-11, terrorism was seen not only as an intellectual backwater in many ways, uh, but not an existential threat and not something that needed to be uh, kind of primary. And and I think now with that hindsight, I think we have the willpower and, and we do have the capabilities to do it without a permanent military presence. So I think that if you had that type of threat emerging, then I think we would be able to handle that. It's, again, not to say that it's simple, snap of the fingers, but it, it's certainly something we can do without having that military presence. Because if we have to have a military presence in every country that could be a, a place that terrorist organizations could find safe harbor, we'd have to be garrisoning so many parts of the world. And again, it's not necessary. And we've proven that in other places. Not to mention the fact that a group like Al Qaeda doesn't require a, the so-called safe haven. They can plan these things in developed countries. We saw some of the planning and training for 9-11 happening in Europe and happening in Florida. So again, it's a kind of misunderstanding of the case to think we needed to rebuild and refashion Afghan society so that this could never happen again. It's just, it's just, it's just a bad theory of the case. So the moral and intellectual case against staying in Afghanistan perpetually is one that uh, I think is fairly popular. It's it's one that has broad support uh, among the American people. They're sick and tired of the war. One of the things I've been seeing, I think, from a lot of fairly dishonest actors is a desire to pivot away from that argument about whether we should be there at all and instead pivot to a question of tactics, specifically around the tactics of this withdrawal um, and, and what's been going on over the last couple of weeks, which has been, I, I think, undeniably fairly chaotic. Um, a, walk us through what exactly the Biden administration did in the last couple of weeks that caused uh, the events that have transpired to transpire. And B, was there anything wrong with it? Could it have been done better? And if so, how? Yeah, and I think it's important for the context to separate out the rationale for the withdrawal from how it was implemented. And and I think the, the case I made earlier, which is you don't need a permanent military presence there to achieve our very limited national interests in a place that's admittedly a strategic backwater. It's not economically important to the United States. It's not all that strategically important other than the nexus potentially with international terrorism that's anti-American in, in its nature. But... Uh, you know, so th so th there's really uh, less significance to Afghanistan. Uh, and so that decision makes a lot of sense to get out. The question of the implementation, though, is one in which it was going to be messy. And I think those who had advocated for withdrawal, either in the Trump administration or uh, in the Biden administration and the people around those decisions, had internalized that it was not going to be immaculate. It was going there was going to be some messiness. In fact, you know, there were, uh, you know, one could imagine a lot of different scenarios in which this had gone actually worse. And I still think that people who had favored withdrawal had internalized the potential for that. Um, so imagine if the government doesn't collapse as rapidly as it does, and there's, say, urban warfare in Kabul with civilians um, in between that, that could have been very, a, a very, um, uh, that could have been a worse situation than what we're seeing. And uh, uh, but I still think, again, uh, the United States' national interest dictated we leave and the United States has limited responsibility to others as it conducts its foreign policy, uh, you know, particularly because um, the primary responsibility that states have is to their own people and the interests of their people. 
Uh, and so the idea that the United States would have weighty moral responsibilities to settle out the, a civil war is simply not supported by the the nature of uh, you know the kind of justification of government in the first place, right? Which is uh, aimed at providing uh, security to the members of uh, our national polity. You uh, were nominated by President Trump to potentially be the ambassador to Afghanistan from the United States during the latter days of the Trump administration. And so there's a there's an alternative history where or you may well have not been here during these months, but been in Afghanistan being part of a successful withdrawal in a Trump term too, um, assuming, and I think this is wise to assume, that you would have been part of conversations about what that withdrawal would look like, uh, and with hindsight, is there anything that you would have suggested uh, they do differently than, say, the path that the Biden administration has taken now? Yeah, I mean, I'm hesitant to Monday morning quarterback because, you know, there's always a non-falsifiable counterfactual that if only we had done X, if only we had done Y. Uh, these types of, of uh, withdrawals are, are difficult and challenging uh, under the best of circumstances. And we were lucky that, that Trump negotiated the Doha agreement because it allowed us to withdraw without having to be under fire. And I think that's an understated advantage of what Ambassador Khalilzad and the Trump administration was able to accomplish with the Doha agreement is that there hasn't been an American killed since the agreement. And, and that's with the United States engaged in the retrograde out of the country. Uh, and I think that shouldn't be understated because, uh, again, back to the issue of moral responsibility, uh, the chief responsibility is, is that our commander in chief has is to uh, Americans in harm's way, particularly our troops, uh, and so in, in some ways you could you could argue that that uh, uh, this agreement had provided for the most important thing, which is to allow us to have an honorable withdrawal with a, a deal in which Americans weren't fighting their way out of the country. Um, you know, for 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 people who are are well educated in history, you didn't want to see something like. Uh, you know, Xenophon's Anabasis, where you're having the people having to, f you know, an, ar an army fight its way out of a country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so uh, again, I, I think in that sense, um, you know, I'm glad that we didn't see that. Uh, do, I, do I wish that there had been more time for this to happen? I think that a lot of people were caught by surprise in how fast the regime collapsed. And to me, the quickness of the end of the uh, Ghani government uh, only lends credence to the idea that the government didn't have the legitimacy, the staying power, uh, the ability to govern uh, without uh, the coalition backing it up and suggests that this 20 year project at nation building was such an utter failure. Mm -hmm. And it lends credence to that withdrawal. Were there some things you might do differently? Uh, yes, I'm sure. Yeah, no doubt. But I am hesitant to Monday morning quarterback because these things are messy and because it's still early in terms of our ability to understand how well or how badly this went. And of course, any, you know, human being who saw the events at the airport and saw the, those struggling Afghans, you know, trying to get out of the country and and uh, and, and, you know, some of them. Uh, dying in the as you know in that process, you know how could you how, how could those things not pull at your heartstrings? Uh, but again, um, we have to avoid the the I think the conceit that these things could be easy and done immaculately. It seems like there's two broad categories of um, criticism that. Uh, you know uh, the blob in Washington has levied when it comes to this withdrawal, and and it, it's two kind of broad buckets. I would say it's it's the human costs and then material costs. And so in the human costs, there's obviously the layers of the actual American military that's present there. There's the cadre of Afghans that were uh, helping our armed forces in the form of translators and others. And then there's the uh, uh, social repercussions that will be accrued to Afghan civilians uh, by our withdrawal. This is the you know women going to school argument. And then on the material side, there is the argument about uh, the 
uh, military equipment that has been left behind within Afghanistan, and then also uh, some mineral resources that um, uh, I've seen people point out as a potential asset. So you you made the case that you know we we actually were fairly successful in terms of getting our troops out. What about those other pools of of resources? It, are, is it everything it's cracked up to be in terms of what we're losing throughout uh, this withdrawal, or or is it a slightly more complicated story? Yeah, it's a slightly more complicated story, but I do want to go backwards just a second to two points. One is that the American public was with the Trump administration and with President Biden on the decision to withdraw. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, some of the polls showed, you know, two thirds, 70 percent of the American public. How many issues are 70, 30 issues in American politics given polarization today? And so I think we see a situation where uh, both of the last two presidents and the public were in favor of this. And you had a, a Washington establishment that admittedly there were people who, who had also come around to this view. Uh, and I'm glad to see some of those people mugged by reality, if you will. <laughs> um, and and so I, I think that, that it can't be lost that this did have, it was something that was broadly, I think, supported. And that despite some of those images that are, again, you know, terrible from Afghanistan, you've seen public support stand up. And I think that there's a, a kind of, uh, you know, to, to steal a word from academia, a kind of pretty prudent public here on this. Mm -hmm. And so majorities, even after those scenes, have, have supported the withdrawal. And I think that there's a kind of realism there. Americans, I think, understand that after 20 years of this project, trillions of dollars spent, you know, 2,400 American lives, many, many thousands more wounded, that they're simply tired of this type of project. Uh, and, and so that's an important thing. The other thing, too, is back to what I said about, about you know, the collapse of the government, what that meant. I mean, the architects of withdrawal should not be the ones we're levying our fire against. It's the architects of 20 years mm -hmm. of a failed policy. And the fact that there's been almost no accountability for these people is just, it's its rich, right? It's amazing. Um, and I think that's a big problem. I mean, you see, you know, again, you know, I understand he's, you know, someone who, who, who made a sacrifice to his country in terms of serving people like David Petraeus and, and others of the generals and admirals. But, you know, you, these are people who have been peddling uh, arguments for the war, for how we should prosecute the war that didn't turn out to be uh, well suited to the to the conditions of of Afghanistan and well suited to our our capabilities and the and the constraints. And yet they're still feted in this town. Uh, they're still invited to give talks about what we ought to do when they've been repeatedly wrong about this. And I think that's a, a real it shows you that the marketplace of ideas um, is still not where it needs to be, uh, particularly in terms of the demand signal for the supply of commentary. Why? Why isn't? Why? Why aren't people? You know, directing their ire at people like that, generals that have gotten us into this war um, for so long. Well, I mean, it, it's it's. It's a complicated question about you know why is the uh, this uh, intellectual and policy community behaving the way it is. I mean, I, I think part of it is that if you admit the failure of those ideas, in some ways you're admitting the failure of your own ideas when it's people who have broadly spoken, whether journalists, think tankers, or people in the in the national security establishment. You know, when they share those views, um, I mean, some of these ideas about forward presence, about counterinsurgency, about the use of American military power to remake societies, uh, that if you would admit that David Petraeus or General Allen or others are wrong, uh, then you're essentially saying that, that you're wrong. And if we shouldn't listen to those people, why should they listen to you? I mean, think about some of the journalists that, you know, I don't like to fight with people by name uh, who buy ink by the barrel. But if you think about some of the journalists that are involved in this space, uh, you know, they share those views broadly. Um, so I think it's actually when we see people admitting that they got this wrong, it's actually an act of courage in this town. So I would praise, for example, Admiral Mullen, uh, who recently came out and, and talked about how we should have left earlier. It's great to see that. Uh, and I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to think more people would reflect uh, upon what does this mean? And, and that's why I think, and, and again, you know, maybe we, we can broaden out from Afghanistan at this point. I think Afghanistan is a discrete issue. 
Uh, but it's part of a bigger battle for the future of American foreign policy and the future of America's role in the world. And this battle has been joined pretty, uh, you know, pretty fiercely, uh, especially over the last five years. Uh, and I think that this has really crystallized that battle. And you're seeing that and seeing that there are far more critics of realism and restraint out there now than there used to be, because at first they would generally ig ignore us. Yeah. Right. Um, cranks, fringe, isolationists. Yeah, all. you know, <laughs> all those pejoratives, yeah. you know, we can ignore these people. Uh, you know, you didn't see a lot of realists and restrainers on panels at, at, at the established think tank events. Mm -hmm. um, and there weren't a lot of places, actually, honestly, where there were realists and restrainers. Mm -hmm. uh, but now there are far more voices of realism and restraint on both sides of the aisle, uh, on, among progressives and conservatives, libertarians, liberals. Uh, I think that realism and restraint has now been institutionalized in many ways. Uh, so you see groups like Defense Priorities, American Moment, you see uh, the Quincy Institute, uh, you see centers at places like the Atlantic Council, uh, ICG, Carnegie Endowment, that have uh, scholars who are working in the vein of the realism and restraint community and really challenging the status quo approach either from the outside or from from inside traditional uh, um, you know, think tanks. And, and I think that's heartening, but it also shows you that this is not a kind of Afghan specific issue or a fly by night fight, uh, particularly because for example, with, you know, with where, where I work in the Stand Together community, we're in it for the long haul um, and we're not going away in terms of trying to help support this, I think, richer, deeper, exciting movement of people that wanna challenge the status quo uh, make the intellectual and advocacy arguments against continuing in our endless wars or continuing to subsidize our wealthy populist allies in Europe or who have or, or who want to, you know, I think, get China wrong, either too hot or too cold. Right. I think that realism and restraint is, is, is now emerging as a legitimate counter elite and a legitimate counter perspective. And ideally, this will, I think, um, become a, a, a you know, either a balancing, uh, you know, have a balance of power with primacy or even become America's next strategic culture. Uh, and I, that would be wonderful. Uh, again, there are a lot of, di uh, of smart arguments on the other side that need to be contested and it needs to be wrestled out in this kind of marketplace of ideas that I think is much healthier than it's ever been, at least since the Vietnam War, if not all the way back uh, even further. So let's zoom out to broader foreign policy. Uh, I'm sure that you can and probably have taught entire courses about the question I'm about to ask you, but in a few sentences, what are the core premises and implications of this realism and restraint that you speak of? What, 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 what does it mean to identify more with that community as opposed to, and you've been using the term, the primacy community, you know, I've used terms like liberal internationalist, globalist, maybe another term one could use. What distinguishes these two camps and uh, make the steel man case for your cadre? <laughs> Well, in a nutshell, it's realism about the nature of the world around us and restraint in how we use military power in it to advance American national interests, which we define, you know, relatively narrowly and consistent with the proper role of government. So we look at American national interests being our territorial integrity, right, our homeland security. We look at it as the conditions of our economic prosperity and making sure that our liberal democratic system here at home is, is healthy and flourishing. Uh, those are the three primary goals. And the question is, is how can military, uh, our military capabilities support that uh, and, and how other aspects of our foreign policy making can support those goals. And what that means is that the United States needs to have a strong national defense, I would even argue second to none, right? We ought to maintain uh, a kind of um, uh, uh, supreme military power and we can do that. We're a, real, we're a very rich country uh, with a lot of capabilities and a lot of, and we have this, you know, military tradition um, in which we we can have a very capable uh, defense and defensive uh, capability and uh, deterrent. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we need to go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, right? We, we can rely on defense and deterrence in most cases. That's why we should have a strong nuclear deterrent. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in uh, in nuclear weapons and having a strong subsurface capability for that. 
we can have a strong navy that can keep us um, safe in terms of our connection to the rest of the world, um, either for commerce or for uh, uh, you know defending against those who would do us harm. Uh, and I think uh, an air power and a space capability, right, to to keep us uh, keep our you know satellites and our space capabilities protected, uh, especially because those are important for us in a global economy. And so we can do that, um, but at the same time, stay out of certain projects that aren't connected to those three goals, right? So uh, remaking other societies, democracy promotion by the sword. We don't need to do that to keep us safe. We don't need to do that to protect our econ ep economic prosperity. In fact, doing that gets us into trouble that actually undermines our economic prosperity. Uh, you think about the trillions of dollars spent in Iraq and Afghanistan and throughout the greater Middle East. Those are things that would have been better used for domestic priorities. And people could argue about that. Should it be for infrastructure? Should it be for, um, you know, if you're a progressive for a different type of healthcare system, if you're a libertarian or a conservative, maybe for returning that money to the private uh, sector or to the people who actually earned it in the first place, right? We can argue about where that dividend can go. But the fact is, is that we would we could be doing different things with that those resources than what we did with them. Um, and then you also just think about, uh, you know, if you think about our safety, I mean, what about the thousands of Americans and their families that have suffered by these foreign wars that didn't tear up to those basic functions of government and that didn't make us safer because oftentimes they, you know, were basically hitting hornet's nests, um, you know, so. Restraint is about using military power carefully and for very specific ends that connect up with the with the, with the just regime. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I wanted to ask before I forgot it. You know, we talked about maintaining a strong defense is uh, is obviously necessary. You know, it doesn't mean you have to go and rebuild other nations and do all these things we've been doing. But how do you maintain? How should we go about maintaining a strong defense without empowering? You know, the surveillance state. And that's why I talked about uh, our you know, safeguarding our liberal democratic system here at home is part of how we should think about an interest that relates to foreign policy, because we don't want to have a boomerang effect of our national security state in its, even its well-intentioned efforts abroad. And so we have to, you know, have certain safeguards and barriers against those types of effects at home that would undermine what a, what a, what a good regime would be for us here. Um, you know, so the surveillance state, um, you know, for the, uh, you know, thinking about like the militarization of policing. And again, policing is a complicated subject. Uh, I'm, I'm not naive about the nature of the world. There are people who would aggress against us, but you know, and there are, and there are also people here at home who would do law abiding citizens harm. And so you do need to have a military and a policing capability. Um, but do you need to militarize that policing capability? Uh, you know, do we need to try to import those types of practices that are best served or maybe not even best served for the for the battlefield um you know think about no knock raids um you know no knock raids were things that you know night raids were things that annoyed people in places like afghanistan for good reason uh are those things really appropriate here at home either uh i mean if they're not appropriate abroad i have a hard time believing they're appropriate here at home so these are the types of things where we have to make sure that we're careful that we don't e extinguish what's great about living in a in a liberal democracy like ours in the broadest sense of liberalism, not not necessarily the modern sense. But uh, you know we have to make sure we safeguard that. I mean, in much the same way though that uh, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. If our military was kept roughly at the same size and scope, and the wall was covered in hammers, isn't that sort of naive to think that it will necessarily or it won't necessarily look for things to do um, well that's why at the same size yeah i mean that's why you I, I mean again i'm not saying that you keep it at the same size that mm -hmm. it needs to be you know over 700 billion in terms of its budget and and then the same number of uh, uh in terms of our uh you know troop and strength i think we could uh, achieve get a lot more bang for the buck in terms of those interests we're talking about with a military that is still second to none but isn't e necessarily eating up those resources or is used differently, right? So um, an army is certainly something that, you know you need. 
uh, but does it need to be as large as the one we have? Could we be using those resources better in uh, for the Air Force uh, or the new Space Force or for the Navy, in particular the Navy, right? Especially because, and again, I'm partial. Uh, I'm a, a Navy reservist. I'm not here speaking for the Navy or the DOD, just speaking for myself and the Stand Together community. But uh, part of the reason I joined the Navy is uh, is because I think the Navy is most the most consistent type of military power for protecting a liberal democracy, given the nature of the world around us and the nature of America. You know, we're a maritime country and uh, our Navy can keep our uh, adversaries far away and provide an effective deterrence. Um, you know, so maybe we should build more submarines. We maybe we should build um, uh, a larger navy, uh, but structured differently, rather than having such a large standing army, uh, or uh, you know some of the other aspects of our kind of modern military in terms of the different types of platforms we build. We should probably pivot again. Realism and restraint would would ask us to have a given the strategy is different. Your means would be different as well. So if we're talking about China, for example, you know, how can we balance against a rising China without getting ourselves into a new Cold War? You know what I mean? There's a right. lot of people on the right. It seems like they they're agitating for war and a lot of these things. But at the same time, we don't want to be naive to, you know, the, um, you know, the, the real threats that right. they may pose to us. And again, realism is not pacifism and it, and it doesn't take the, the view that the nature of the international system is benign. Right. It believes it's an anarchic system in which states have to secure themselves in a potentially dangerous world. And that sometimes means that peers or near peers can be uh, challengers and could present dangers. So it's realistic. But I want to talk about some of those other things, because when we talk about realism being the foundation for restraint, at least the version I hold, you have to think about the threat environment, because I wouldn't be a restrainer in every period of history for every state. If I were an advisor to Prussia in the 1860s, I wouldn't ask, you know, ask us to pursue restraint in, in the same way as I would ask us to pursue it today. Right? I would ask, like, I think that there were good reasons for, say, Prussia to have allies or to be engaged in conflict that was necessary to secure itself in a dangerous North European context. Um, I think that restraint is the right approach now because some of the things that realism teaches us. So first... The nuclear revolution matters, okay? Before the nuclear revolution, we had to worry about a single state dominating Eurasia to a much different degree than we do now. And a nuclear revolution means that as long as we maintain the, you know, meet the criteria of successful deterrence, then homeland security is, 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 is darn close to, to uh, you know, to 100%. Right. Nothing's 100 percent in life. You always have to be careful. And that's why you should have some hedges. But the fact is, is that it's a powerful deterrent against any aggressive state actor aggressing upon the United States. Secondly, is that, you know, we have two relatively weak neighbors who are friendly to us and have an interest in bandwagoning with the United States. So that's great. We have two big moats between us and the rest of the world. And people talk about, oh, the world is like flatter and, and smaller. It's still a really big place in which geography matters a lot, right? It's very difficult to, to project power across water. It's, you know, one scholar from the University of Chicago has talked about the stopping power of water. It's really hard to project that power. I mean, what if the Chinese, are they going to do, you know, kind of the million man swim, right? How are they going <laughs> to get here without us using our capabilities to keep them far away? And then you add on top of that the fact that uh, in Eurasia, right, uh, any potential hegemon has challenges achieving that hegemony and being able to project power ac across this body of water, even if that were easy. You think about Russia. I mean, Russia has an economy the size of what, Spain? Its military spend every year is what, about 60, 65 billion? You know, that's, that's like an OCO for us, right? It's a tenth of what we spend. Uh, it's it's technology is not as good as ours in many cases. Its ability to project power. I mean, remember they had that uh, you know mil that naval vessel that was going to Syria, and it was almost like a joke. Right? <laughs> um, now that doesn't mean that they can't make mischief in their backyard, or they couldn't you know contribute to their own allies' uh, efforts um, you know in Syria. Uh, but it's not a menace to the wealthy populous states of Western Europe that are far richer when combined more populous and have less headaches and, and problems than Russia does in terms of Russia's demographic problems, its other cultural problems. Europe is relatively robust compared to Russia. 
It's not as robust as it should be, uh, but it's relatively robust. It could defend itself quite easily. Uh, then you look at, at at Asia. That's a bit of a more a more of a challenge, right? Because China is a rising country. It's populous. It's wealthy as a whole, even though its per capita GDP is still not where we are, not even close. Mm-hmm. Um, it's building a stronger military, but it is still has challenges at home, and it has India to the south. It has you know Vietnam, which it fought a war with in 1979. It has Japan, a powerful country itself, highly technologically capable, not spending enough on its own military. Just that's kind of a theme when the United <laughs> States provides extended deterrence. Uh, you know, lo and behold, states free ride on the United States. You have South Korea, you have Philippines, other countries, right? So, so China has a a, a series of countries around it um, that have an incentive to balance against Chinese power. And again, China has its own problems. It's not to say that China isn't something to worry about. It is. There are real problems. One are economic, right? So IP protection, right? Uh, tech theft, espionage, tech transfer, right? Those are real problems that we can wrestle with. And then you have just the issue that, again, as a hedge, it's good to make sure that we're keeping up a capability uh, uh, to, to deter the Chinese and, and defend, if necessary, against their rise. But that means that we can find, a, I think, a solution that we don't want it to be Cold War II. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you think about the Cold War, we ended up supporting Savimbi and Angola. Uh, we were, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, in, in Nicaragua. We were in Vietnam fighting that tragic war. Uh, we were, we were, we were, um, we were stretching ourselves thinner than we needed to, especially because what we really needed to do, like George Kennan talked about, is contain the Soviet Union uh, and then uh, ideally wait for the contradictions of the Soviet system to reveal themselves. And that's actually what happened. Yeah, there was the Ronald Reagan buildup that, you know, I'm sure on the margins was helpful at making it happen faster, but the internal contradictions of the Soviet system were dooming it. I think when it comes to China, they're not as foolish as the communists were. I mean, yes, it's the Communist Party, but they're not practicing the same kind of command and control economics that the Soviets did. They're still engaging in political malinvestment because of the power of the party. It's not a, a freewheeling free market system. Um, so they're not going to they're not going to have some of those problems, but they do have some of those challenges uh, that I think any planned system has. And so I think if we remain confident, we try to get our own house in order here in the United States, that we will we will be able to meet this challenge, especially if we're able to pivot out of the Middle East, rationalize our policy there. The Middle East is of declining strategic importance. Uh, and we don't need to be mucking around in those areas because we know that they're like hornet's nests. And we don't need to be settling out a, you know, hundreds of years collision between the Sunnis and the Shiites, for example, or fighting in you know, Helmand province um, and building schools. Uh, what we need to do is, again, um, getting out of the Middle East to an offshore position in which we are, uh, you know, uh, pr- protecting our ability for freedom of lawful navigation in that region, um, but not trying to sort out these countries. Uh, and then we need to we need to push our current European allies to carry more weight through burden sharing and burden shifting. And we should be open to the idea of greater strategic autonomy by these wealthy populist countries Uh, and that'll and and have them focus on on the issue of Russia. And given their their higher incentive uh, or greater incentive to make sure that 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 Russia doesn't present a problem, uh, they'll build ideally would build the right capabilities to deter and defend against that threat. And so we can safely concentrate our interests on the Americas uh, and on the rise of China. Um, and I think that 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 will allow us to handle some of our foreign challenges better and our domestic situation, because we have a lot of problems in this country that we need to solve. And we could talk about that all night long about the challenges. And again, I think that's something that people on the left and the right share is that they recognize that when we stack up all the priorities of our country, the most important ones are primarily domestic. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember that uh, there was a tweet that Jennifer Rubin, one of the silliest people in American public life, had a couple days ago where there was a, a, a very recent, you know, in the middle of this withdrawal poll of what Americans care about. And, and her, uh, grievance was that Afghanistan did not crack the top five. Um, 
And you find that that's very rarely the case, that foreign affairs crack the top five. And to the extent that they ever have in the last 20 years, it's been the implications of foreign affairs here at home, which may be terrorism. And so, yeah, the American people are broadly interested in in domestic politics, and, and that's a good thing. And you know, part of what we care about here at American Moment is making sure that the right has substantive answers to some of those domestic politics questions. Um, but- and before 9-11, we were underappreciating the threat of terrorism, and we need to take it seriously. Again, uh, it is something that needs to be, I think, approached realistically in terms of how it should rack and stack against other issues. Um, and we've overinvested now in that area, but it doesn't mean it's unimportant. But in terms, of, so in so in in, in two thousand and one, it, it should have been a higher priority on our list before nine eleven. Um, but with the virtue of hindsight, we, I think we can appropriately rack and stack it with these domestic priorities. And and I think that we're in a process. I think where the right and left um, are trying to find a path forward uh, against a kind of you know like. Ben Rhodes and President Obama talked about against this kind of blobby notion that foreign policy should be center stage in our debates nationally and in how, and, and in how we do our in, in how we budget for all the priorities that the government handles. As that blob kind of looks to the China question as a new avenue of activity, I mean, there's there's a there's a motif that I saw a Twitter thread on recently, which is every you know, prestige magazine that decides to do a cover story on China always does some version of an imperial dragon emblazoned with the yellow stars and, you know, colored red, thrusting a sword into the world or eating it or wrapping it around, strangling it. It's just, it's a very silly and tired trope at this point. What are you seeing in terms of how the blob is using the China issue as a vehicle to reestablish or deepen its control and authority in an era where there is populist energy on both right and left to depose them from that authority? Well, it, it it's interesting because you th- if you think historically, so we had the Cold War, which justified a certain foreign policy uh, platform, right, or, or position. And I think it was justified, right, given the nature of the Soviet threat. Now, I think we overreacted in a lot of ways, but I think the basic contours of containment were, especially early in the Cold War, were were necessary. And then right after that, you all of a sudden have the rogue state doctrine. You know, so this is the thing that, you know, fingers people like Saddam Hussein as the big threats that we have to prepare for. You know, this is Milosevic, this is Saddam Hussein and others. And then after 9-11, it's the GWAT, right? It's terrorism. And now we're quickly pivoting into, into great power competition, which really means China. Yeah. Um, although a lot of people want to add places like Iran and whatnot, because again, like, hey, let's just put it, put all the, you know, let's cr- do the Christmas tree thing. Yeah. We'll put all kinds of things on this concept because we really don't want to change what we're doing. Yeah, let's go to war with China, Russia, and Iran. <laughs> right. I mean, America, Team America, hell yeah, yeah. right? So... <laughs> The fact is, is that that unfortunately we have a situation where we're frequently, um, I think, engaging in threat inflation. We've certainly done that in a number of ways. I mean, in the 90s, absolutely threat inflation around around uh, the rogue states. Right. Particularly because the 90s should have been a time in which we renewed our domestic uh, scene. And, and maybe some of the problems we're now seeing, well, we could have had a better handle on if we had focused more attention on that renewal. You know, again, I said earlier that I think that that terrorism was obviously something we had to keep our eye on, and there were certain things we needed to do, especially in terms of the defenses. Um, but quickly, it, it became such a focus of all of our energies and attention uh, that we did let slip. I mean, you know, look, Bill Clinton wins in 1992 in part on the it's the economy, stupid, right? Thinking that George W. H. W. Bush had been too focused on foreign policy matters. I think Donald Trump, uh, one of the reasons why he and President Obama did better than their opponents in 2008 and 2016 is because they were saying we needed to focus more on some of these domestic issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think sometimes we forget, um, you know, that even George W. Bush had campaigned on no new nation building. Uh, and if you look at my Twitter feed at Will Ruger, uh, I did some. I I, I quoted uh, uh, or I uh, retweeted a quote. Uh, I think that Kurt Mills at the American Conservative had put out, uh, giving this great line from candidate Bush 
that could have been spoken by President Trump or President Obama in 2008 or, or any number of candidates that said, like, look, this is a mistake. We should not be doing things like Iraq. Everyone runs as a realist. Yeah, I mean, they ought to because it's appealing. I mean, this is the thing, right? Like, the, I think that that the candidates who and again, in certain circumstances, it's not appropriate, right? Like, I, I think that uh, there were good reasons to go to war in, in 2001 with Afghanistan. But yeah, I mean. Realism, I think, at root is not very popular here in Washington. And I think Americans sometimes don't want to sound realist, right? They, In a way, it's a, a kind of like, well, I don't want to sound too hard hearted. But they do tend to favor people who are, who are, I think, making realist cases in a lot of instances. Now, again, the public can be fickle. Um, but I think at heart, do Americans want to send their sons and daughters to faraway places unless they can see a connection to their safety? And they're willing to give politicians, I think, a lot of leeway like they did after 9-11. But eventually that runs out. And I think, you you, you know, or obviously the Iraq war squandered a lot of the that kind of leeway the American public was willing to give them. And, and I think the uh, one of the best examples, I mean, it was it was it's still, you know, right at the fore of my head is is remember in in the 2016 primary in the debate when in South Carolina when President Trump went after you know Jeb Bush and went after the Bushism uh, in terms of foreign policy really and you would have thought in South Carolina deep red big military state that just going after it that hard you'd think maybe he's he this is the thing that's going to do him in with the Republican base not at all, right? He wins going away, wins the nomination, wins the presidency. And there's some evidence, uh, people like Kreiner and Shen research on this, that 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 uh, his views, that he was perceived to be the less hawkish candidate. I don't even like that term less hawkish because it suggests that that like restrainers or Trump or doves. Uh, it's more like the that the more prudentialist candidate versus the more the less insane candidate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the less interventionist candidate, uh, you know, that they that this actually helped him in some of these upper Midwest states, for example. Yeah. yeah. So so what do you think after four years of Trump and now in hindsight, what do you think his his legacy will be on different things? I mean, you got Iran, China, uh, him introducing those things. And obviously he wanted to get out of a lot of these places. Um, and I guess for for many reasons, I'd like to hear your thoughts on why you think that he wasn't able to be successful in that in terms of getting out of Afghanistan and these other wars. Um, but Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I like to call balls and strikes. And, and I've done that recently where despite the fact that, you know, I had a connection to the, you know, the to Trump world uh, through my nomination. Um, and, you know, I'm a conservative. Uh, but I've been willing to praise President Biden for carrying out the Trump withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I would have liked if it had stuck to the original timeline and one could quibble with with the implementation. But again, I'm not Monday morning quarterbacking because I, I've been happy to see President Biden stick to his guns, which are really the guns that that President Trump loaded. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so I think that that uh, I'm willing to call balls and strikes here. And what I would say with, with President Trump is that I think the fact that he didn't start a new war was the first president not to do that in some time mm -hmm. is an underappreciated accomplishment of the Trump administration, particularly because if I had one criticism of President Trump, it would be that he didn't pick a team, generally speaking, that was supportive of his instincts in foreign policy. And yet, despite that, he was able to resist those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of people who thought that President Trump was going to go to war with Iran. But look, when it came to the the drone that was shot down and the Soleimani strike crisis, President Trump didn't give in, I think, to any kind of hawkish impulse or hawkish advice he was getting. Uh, I think when it came to Afghanistan, he wanted to get the United States out of it. He now look, he he early in his presidency, he had given McMaster and others the the um, uh, what they wanted or part of what they wanted, but then quickly said, look, we're gonna we're gonna try to uh, you know get a deal with the Taliban and get out of this conflict honorably. And he set us, like I said, I, he loaded that gun and he set us on that path. And I think the Doha agreement saved American lives and no American, knock on wood, right, has been killed uh, since then in, in Afghanistan. And I and so I think that, that he should be given credit for the Doha agreement. He should be given credit for the realism of that policy. 
I've liked how President Biden has talked about the deal, I will say. Uh, I think that it has some of the arguments that he's been making have been quite realist, right? Uh, so not merely, you know, centered on that old, you know, who wants to be the last American dying in this foreign war, right? That more liberal trope. It's been around, I think, kind of core understandings of the national interests and the constraints. And, and you know, he's pretty honest about like, hey, it's not our sons and daughters job to secure human rights in this country. He's he, and, and I think that's been he's good... used the term the national interest in interviews. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so I think that that that. But 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 again, President Trump loaded that gun, yeah. and I and I and I do wonder if President Trump hadn't got us on this path towards withdrawal and and reduced our troops, you know, and had a deadline, you know, would the Biden administration gone that direction or would it maintained a CT force? And we all know a CT force in a country like that, they're going to get drawn into it. I mean, could you imagine having a CT force there and then having the government start to collapse? It would have been lots of temptation to use that force to support the government and we'd be right back into the same barrel we were in. Um, again, I, I, it's hard to know what he would have done, but I think that it was important that we were on that path. Uh, you know, I think that when it comes to pressuring our allies in Europe around burden sharing, that's something that that President Trump. I mean, again, his his rhetoric is is uh, boisterous. It's aggressive. <laughs> uh, but is it good for the Europeans to to kind of get the message or get a message, given that? You know, one of the things I, I, I haven't loved about President Biden is talking about sacred alliances. There's nothing sacred to these things. I mean, heck, our own history shows this, That's right? That's blasphemous to call them sacred. <laughs> well, uh, yes, but uh, but it's blasphemous for me in the foreign policy religion not to say that they aren't, right? <laughs> but the fact is, like, George Washington showed this in his first administration, where the most important alliance in American history was our alliance with the French, right? We probably wouldn't have won our independence without that alliance, uh, but we still tossed that alliance overboard when it was in our interest to do so. And our best president, George Washington, uh, understood that, mm -hmm. that national interest had to be uh, in the top, uh, had to be the thing calling the shots. You know, and Jefferson argued with that, but eventually Jefferson came on board too. And then for a hundred years, we had a grand strategy of Washington's great rule, right? Like avoiding military uh, intervention in the old world and avoiding entangling alliances. And that served us quite well. And I think a, a policy of realism and restraint would also serve us well in that same fashion. And, and look, we, we are so powerful that, that we could be above the fray and choose when to intervene and when not based on our interests, harboring our, our power for the future uh, and renewing our domestic society that is in great need of renewal. And I think, again, like conservatives and progressives would have a different vision of what renewal looked for, but I'd love for that to be the focus of our argument. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanna finish on asking you, you kind of mentioned tr Trump being surrounded by a lot of people who are hawkish and all these things. And obviously at American Moment, one of the things we're really excited about doing is trying to fill the personnel pipeline with a lot of good people on these issues. A lot of our applicants and people that were fellows or people that had worked with like the John Quincy Adams Society and the lead of a lot of these things. I guess what would, what would be your advice to young people who want to get into these circles, but maybe feel like they're the odd man out in terms of the way things are viewed around here? You know, what would be your advice to them or resources they can go to and things like that? For young people who aren't excited for, you know, American soldiers to die in service of flying the transgender flag over Pyongyang or something. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that that 20 years ago, it would have been hard for me to honestly say you should put all your eggs in the basket of being a foreign policy restrainer. Now, I think actually that there's a much better uh, supply and demand, if you will. And, and in fact, I think that this institutionalism of realism and restraint I talked about before is is well along. I don't think it's where it needs to be. Uh, and so I would encourage people who uh, who. Uh, who could spare a dime, uh, you know, to support these institutions like the John Quincy Adams Society or Defense Priorities, or if you're on the progressive side uh, or even conservative side, uh, you know, the Quincy Institute or others, right? We do need more resources because there is a demand, I think, uh, for younger people who don't ha aren't captured by some of these old analogies or old contexts and, and, and haven't escaped those things like the Cold War, you know, assumptions, you know, that everything is Munich or that, 
you know, that restraint is, uh, is, uh, you know, somehow, um, you know, uh, uh, lacking in courage. In fact, it's, it's being courage and courageous enough to, to kind of not think that you always have to be intervening. Um, but I think that there's an opportunity now for people to, there's a lot of excitement and, and opportunities. Um, but we still need to grow this community there. You know, one thing I'm, I'm really looking forward to eventually seeing one of the major newspapers catch up to the fact that there should be a restrainer on the op-ed page, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, a regular one and, and one who's focused on that, uh, not one who might say it here and there. And there's some good people who are doing this, or, you know, um, both on the left and the right. Uh, but I'd love to see an Andy Basevich or a Steve Wall to have a column at the New York Times, uh, certainly won't ever happen at the Washington Post. I mean, if, or sorry, at the Wall Street Journal. If that happens, my work is kind of done, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I kid. But, you know, look, I, I think that this is realism and restraint is representative where a lot of the public is. It's representative where a substantial part now of the of the elite is not not a majority by any means, but a lot of folks, you guys us included. And so I think that that it, that it would be nice to see those ideas more uh represented more often in major publications. Um, but I think that I think that we were we have a lot of uphill uh, we have a lot of uphill mileage to go uh, because I do think that a lot of those the kind of mindsets, the shared mindsets, you might even call it groupthink that the Washington establishment has on foreign policy uh, makes people in positions of authority and, and who have decision making power, it makes them loath to promote or elevate those voices. And so I, I look, I, I know that on, on, on this podcast, this might be sound odd, but I would really praise the New York Times here because the New York Times has actually featured a fair number of, of realism and restrained voices on its op-ed pages. Now it also has the other side, but that's fine, right? Newspapers could be great places for debates to happen. Uh, but I've been in the New York Times, you know, people like Stephen Wertheim, Emma Ashford, others. That's great to see. Um, and, and I think we should give praise to those institutions when they do that. It doesn't mean I love their front page coverage or, you know, but, but the fact is, is that it's been heartening to see more of those voices being elevated. I just wish that we would see it more because I think realism and restraint has something to offer and that has, a, and that, that a lot of Americans are, are eager. And it's, and again, aside from that, it's good policy and outlets should be interested in policy arguments that are supportive of our national interests. Uh, and I think that these voices do. And back to the accountability issue, they should stop going to some of the same old, same old voices who simply have been wrong about every issue since about, you know, 1991. You know, why do we see people going back to these, these similar uh, folks? Uh, I mean, I guess because they're celebrities of a sort, right? They have like shiny stars on their collars. Um, but that's part of the problem realism and restraint faces is that a lot of realis realists and restrainers haven't served in high government office. Uh, and that's why I'm excited by what you guys are doing in terms of having younger people get their feet wet in the foreign policy arena, groups like John Quincy Adams to help, help them so that they can start to develop the kind of vita that will allow them to take on more responsibilities in the future without sharing the same kind of groupthink or, or the same kind of mindset of the Washington establishment here. But I do think it's commensurate upon, say, you know, whether it's uh, you know President Trump in in two thousand and twenty four, or whether it's some other Republican candidate that is hopefully uh, re, you know his respectful of realism and restraint, or at least would like to see a, a variety of voices in their administration, or President Biden, who has been getting a lot of support from realism and, re, and restraint during this episode. It'd be nice to see them look look at at these folks, um, you know, to look at the Emma Ashfords and Stephen Wertheims or, you know, you know, some of the people affiliated with, um, you know, the defense priorities and other groups to, to look to them for staffing in future administrations because a, they can help support something that's popular with the American public. And it offers a challenge to the status quo that they're going to hear from every other advisor. And because if you care about the future of restraint, there needs to be this pipeline and this pathway in which people can develop the type of credentials that will allow them someday to hold senior offices uh, where those decision makers are vitally important. Well, Dr. Ruger, I just wanted to say thank you for everything you do. I mean, we obviously have disagreements on a lot of matters of domestic policy, but I think on foreign policy, there, there are very few people who are both as 
you know, winsome and capable of making the argument for our perspective and also willing to subsume themselves uh, in very practical ways, including, uh, you know, you agreeing to potentially serve as ambassador to Afghanistan. So thank you for everything that you do. And uh, where can people find more information, uh, you know, look you up and, and learn more? Yeah, uh, Twitter at Will Ruger. Uh, and if you're interested in realism and restraint, feel free to get in touch with me and I'll get you in touch with the right people because one of the things I love about the work I'm doing is to help build this realism and restraint counter elite that can challenge the the primacists and one day hopefully help uh, you know promote a better foreign policy for America. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. This week, we wanted to talk about uh, a piece that I've probably recommended on the show before, but it bears repeating. We, we touched on with Dr. Ruger a little bit, uh, some of the concerns that, that we and, and he uh, share about uh, some of the silliness uh, about the the China question that is emerging on the right. Again, uh, the the imperial dragon emblazoned with red and yellow stars, uh, you know, suffocating the world. It, again, this imagery gets fairly silly. Uh, the piece that I want to highlight is a piece that uh, is one of the first and I think only pieces that I basically insisted go on AmCanon because I think it's the best, most concise and crisp explanation for um, how to think about the China issue from our perspective. And that's called China and Civic Piety. It was written by Micah Metacroft for uh, the uh, Commons blog at American Compass. And it's just absolutely fantastic. Micah's obviously been a previous guest on this show talking about some of his hobby horses like weightlifting and environmentalism. But he also made a very compelling case for, for why a, a prudent approach on China is extremely important for the American right and specifically our faction of it. And the money line in it, and, and I, I've had this memorized now for months, is uh, America owes a strategic counter to China, not to Uyghurs and Hong Kongers, but to the American people. It can sound hard headed, but that's part of what being a realist is. And ultimately, it is the most compassionate approach because it is the responsibility of the American nation and the American regime to look after the interests of the American people. Um, the the China issue is one that that we have an interesting relationship here with American moment because we agree that the foreign policy establishment and indeed the domestic policy establishment for the last 20 to 30 years has been utterly asleep at the wheel on China. But that does not mean that they conveniently get to escape accountability for the loot that they accrued to themselves while selling out the country and say, well, it's time to send a couple aircraft carriers to the South China Sea. Um, in fact, just to give you guys a little bit of a peek behind the curtain, uh, our our statement of 10 priorities includes one on China, and it's, uh, the, it's, I believe, priority five, and it's written as China and the elites who enabled its rise are a generational threat to American prosperity. Uh, that was not the original wording. Uh, in an earlier version, it was something like communist China is a generational threat to American liberty. And there's a couple tweaks there that you can you can kind of notice. The first is, uh, you know, saying communist China is an easy way to conjure that red dragon suffocating the world. So we, we cut that. Uh, and then we we squarely put the focus on the American elites that sold out the country and, and direct our ire towards them, because ultimately China's acting in its national interest as we should. And then lastly, we highlight its threat to our prosperity, not really our security. Again, there's no million man swim coming uh, across the Pacific Ocean to invade Sacramento. Uh, ultimately, the threats we face from China are economic, and that's where the square of our focus should be. Uh, and I know this is an issue that's extremely important to Jake because foreign policy, realism, and restraint is is ultimately what, what made Jake part of this political realignment. Uh, and so, I mean, what are your thoughts, Jake? I don't know. You you kind of got it all in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think um, I think both you and and Dr. Ruger made a lot of great points on the issue. I would definitely recommend reading uh, the piece that Micah put out and also taking a look at our recent um, feature that we did. There's a lot of stuff on China in there and a lot of great things, whether they be clips from other podcasts. We had a great one with John Allen Gay, who's the president of the uh, the John Quincy Adams Society. I would definitely recommend checking that podcast out. Uh, we did we did talk about China, if I'm not mistaken, there as well. We did. Um, but also, there's some really great pieces on 
on Russia and um, the Middle East and also just more uh, theory pieces that you can take a look at, not just pieces, but videos, podcasts and more. And so, um, you know, I, I definitely encourage everyone to go take a look at that. And it's not just, you know, you know, a one specific view on things. We, we, we include some different diverging views, but within this kind of general um, way of thinking. And so, um, yeah, I really, I really uh, appreciate everyone that's already taken a look at Am Cannon, and uh, I would really recommend that you guys go check that out. I think it's really helpful. Um, it's definitely helped, you know, me trying to collate all these things and make it, you know, easy for people to kind of take a look at it and not have to go. There's so many things to read, so um, I hope you enjoy that smaller yeah. list. Jake puts in a lot of. Uh very thankless uh, hard work into assembling M Cannon. So uh, if you don't read it, he will cry. No, I'm kidding. Um, but it, it's really fantastic. And we've gotten so much feedback from people who have read it and had it be in, uh, extremely helpful. In fact, one uh, writer recently um, cited in a piece about the new right uh, in his very first citation of that piece. And he said, if you want to understand what the priorities of this nebulous movement are, just click around American Moments website. That would not be possible if we didn't assemble Am Cannon, because ultimately a bunch of 23 year olds uh, are not the right people to be opining extensively on what the meat on the bones of this agenda needs to be. We recognize that we're epistemically humble enough to do so. And that's why uh, we just pull the best of what we've read and watched and listened to from across the internet uh, in the form of books, essays, podcasts, podcasts, YouTube videos, short pieces, newsletters, and what have you, and, and present it to you. And uh, so if there's ever anything you want to recommend uh, beyond there, you can uh, email Jake. Yeah, and please do, because I, I really do love those recommendations. I can't read everything. Uh, Sarab, Nick, you know, I love when people give me recommendations. Hey, I read this article, this video, this documentary. We'd love to see it. So send it over um, on our Twitter or email me. Uh, and we'd love to feature it if it's something that kind of fits in with well with that. Yeah. Uh, and so, as always, go to AmericanMoment.org to find all of that. Uh, be sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast, five stars. And if you ask a question inside your review, we'll be sure to answer it on this show. Uh, we're now uh, almost up to 30 episodes. It's been a wild ride thus far. We're so grateful to all of you for listening to it. And we'll see you next week. I'll see you on episode 60. <laughs> <laughs> Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.